So the six fundamentals of live sound, I want you to view this under this constraint. The sound system works like the human ear and human mouth. So as we talk about our entire lecture today and then even downstairs, and then when you go back into your specific ministries, I want you to think about the sound system is amplifying what we try to do naturally every day. What is so familiar to us, what is so foundational in the communication process between humans. This is unique to humans. There's no other animal that has the articulation, the dictation, the communication ways that we do. So this is so fundamental, but yet so familiar with everybody in this room. It's the basics of communication. You take away the ability to speak, or you take away the ability to hear, that doesn't stop the communication process, but that greatly hinders the process. So through the constraint of view the sound system as an extension of our ears and our mouth. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. This isn't going to be a, a lesson of, man, this is what's out there, this is what's new, this is what's latest and greatest. All of that stuff has been done for us years and years ago. In the 40s and 50s, 1940s, 1950s, great advancements were made in pro audio. When you stepped into the market of the big concert, so when, when the Beatles came to America, that's when the pro audio side really stepped out because the Beatles would sell out, concert, uh, would sell out concerts in stadiums, but yet they didn't have the sound equipment to fill the space. And so people would rather not even go to a live concert. So thus was born the big concert systems. Up until that point, they'd be taking theater systems out of, TV, uh, out of uh, uh, movie theaters and taking them out on the road. So that's what shifted the mindset of big pro audio. So all the hard work's been done. We're not going to be talking about anything new, anything that's like on the forefront. Actually, we're gonna be taking a step and be looking backwards. And a lot of what I'm gonna be doing today is trying to help you learn some of the questions why, some of the questions that I've been asking why. Why do we do what we do? Why do we have sound checks? Why do we even have a sound system? Much like what Brother Jesse was talking about yesterday, how he's had a, a mind shift change. About three years ago, this started to be my mind shift. Why do we do what we do? <clears throat> And then also we're going to view it this way. Speech and music are different. When you're designing a system for speech, the acoustics and the requirements of the system are completely different than music and vice versa. Now in our service, in our style of service, our primary mode of communication is going to be through the spoken word. Music at our church at Southwest is very important. It's very lively. I love it. So over the years, we've tried to make that cross between how can we have a nice, good, solid system for music, but then how can speech always have the paramount? Okay, how can speech always effortlessly go through the room? So view this as an extension of our body. View this as we're not reinventing the wheel. View this as we're looking backwards and we're trying to ask the questions, why do we do what we do? And then also all the hard work has been done. So let's put this into context. Everybody has a reality in this room. My reality as a sound man, sound engineer, sound technician is not the same as anybody else out here. Your reality is different than mine. The size of the church, the size of the budget, the size of the system, the size of the congregation, even the desires of the pastor. Every one of us has a different reality, but yet we can come into this room and have unity because all of our reality can still be the same. We all have a sound system. We all have different experiences. We all have different styles. We all have the ability, or we all have the, the need to help communicate. We all have to deal with microphones. We all have to deal with batteries, on and off switches. We all have to deal with updating and upgrades. So while all of our realities are different, we can have unity and realize they're different, but yet all of us are going through the same boat just on different scales. The burdens that I go under at Southwest are a lot different than the burdens that most people will go under. If I make a mistake, let's say a 10% mistake, and we have 1,500 people in that room, I've just affected 150 people with a 10% mistake. You have 100 people in a room, you make a 10% mistake, that's only 10 people. It's still a percentage of what's there, but you think about the demands get a lot different when you get bigger. The stakes become a lot higher. There's more burden placed upon you. Also this, our pastor, 
Our pastor helps drive the expectation of our sound system. Our former pastor, Brother Sam, he knew what he wanted, but he wasn't very hands-on. Our current pastor, Brother Gaddis, he knows what he wants, and he's very concerned about the details. We didn't have a sound budget until about four or five years ago. Our sound system several times got into dire straits of we needed to dump ten and fifteen thousand dollars into our system just to bring it back up, just to where it wasn't going to be limping along or we were in fear of this or this or this. Our current pastor is very mindful of that and knows the value that our system brings to the service, so he wants us to stay ahead of ever getting back there again. Two different mindsets, but we're still accomplishing the same thing. So I don't know what your reality is with your pastor, what cues you're taking from him, but it's very important that we get in line with that. But then also, if they need to be educated, I'm not afraid to help educate and say, this is why, this is worthy, this is what we need to do and help legislate some changes, some improvements. This was a, f a funeral I went to. Through that funeral, there were some sound issues, but the biggest thing about the funeral that I took away from was the funeral director stood up three quarters of the way through the service, which would have been right after the, the video started and said, I forgot to charge my laptop. I have 1% battery left. I don't think it's going to make through the entire video. And it didn't. That, that's the takeaway that I took from that funeral. It's a small church, but that place was standing room only. Probably one of the biggest outreach events that that church had in, in recent years. A few months later, I went to another funeral. This was about a 250 seat auditorium. When I took that picture, I just stood up and gave my seat to my wife and the people that I went with, uh, he just stood up as well. They started to put chairs down the side aisles. They put m another row of chairs in the back. They started putting people in the choir loft and then they had the entire foyer full of chairs and then people were standing outside. One of the biggest outreach events of that church's history. I would dare to say that church has never been that full. The sound man couldn't get the cues right. The sound man couldn't get the volume right. When it came to the projector and the video, they couldn't get the projector and the video and the audio to all sync up together at the same time. One of those three were on sporadically. And you could see the frustration of the song leader and of the pastor just on, on the platform looking up into the sound booth knowing that it's humiliating. I went to another funeral and this was in a community hall, a community center. The sound was so atrocious. Most of the time, I couldn't even understand what people were saying. Not only because the sound system and the acoustics of the space were atrocious, but it was also because of how they're using the system as well. This last spring, uh, we went to the uh, Oklahoma City City Council Chambers. And a longtime city manager, Jim Couch, retired. I think he was in that position for 17 years. And a new gentleman, Craig Freeman, stepped into place. He was voted into place. They, had, they told me that that was the fullest those chambers have been in a long time. And you could barely understand the spoken word in those chambers. That, that's, that's, the, that's where policy is made for Oklahoma City is in that room. The acoustics are terrible. And the sound system was even worse. If we were to remove pomp and circumstance, transitions and traditions, schedule and flow, we would come to this one conclusion. We assemble to hear. So if you strip away all of the, all the, all of the theatrics, if I can say, we assemble to hear. And if when we assemble, we can't hear and we can't understand, you need to ask yourself, why do we assemble? Why do we take the time? Why do we ask people to carve sections of their week out and say, please come and assemble? If they can't hear, if they can't understand, why are they assembling? One of the places that we assemble, a, year, a word we use is called auditorium. Here's the etymology of that word, Latin. You can see auditorius, English, auditory. We get auditorium, a place for hearing. So 17th century is about when it was, uh, according to that, when they started using that. So a common definition of auditorium is a large building or hall used for public gatherings, typically speeches or stage performances. How is it that we can go to ancient Greece and go to the Acropolis, which, which would seat over 2,000 people, 
and you could hear without any amplification electronically. It's because there was a time when much attention was given to sound reinforcement. They didn't have the luxury of, we're gonna design a space and then just come and throw a sound system in later. They didn't have that. They had to design the space in mind for their end goal, which was communication. So, the first point of the fundamentals of live sound is going to be the spoken word or the voice. So we're gonna major on mainly just the spoken word today, okay? Uh, we just don't have too many, too many uh, opportunities I don't have too much opportunity to talk much about that. There we go, got it out. So this will be our biggest variable in our sound system is the spoken voice. This is where it all starts. You can have somebody that can sing the same song a month apart, but they're gonna sing it differently based upon how they feel physically, the mood that they're going through, maybe what just happened at work. Do they have a headache? Do they have a cold? Are they recovering? Are they not feeling the song? So our biggest variable in sound systems is the person behind the microphone. When we measure how good our sound system is, there's quite a few different metrics that we use, but one of them that I like to use, and I'm learning, is uh, percentage of alcons. It's cool. Let's see here if I got, yeah. Okay, so this stands for the articulation loss of consonants in speech. I thought I had it written down. So the percentage of alcons is the articulation loss of consonants in speech. Most speech information is carried by the sound of the consonants. Now the vowels create uh, support, dynamics, depth. There's power in the vowels. But we get more of our percussive sounds from our consonants. We get all of our intelligibility from the consonants. Vowels have a lot more power and can very easily overpower the consonants. So if our vowels are overpowering or if we're not pronouncing our consonants very well, our speech intelligibility goes down. So when we're measuring speech intelligibility, what the minimum requirement is 15%. So whoever studies this, the engineers, they say, we'll allow 15% of consonants to be gone and still allow that to be an okay system. 10% is preferred, and when you get into life safety, they only allow 5% of the consonants to be missing. So life safety would be like in a mall, like in a theater, where there's a mass emergency and you have to get life-saving information to every person in there. They only allow 5%. So if you think about life safety, and we take it a step sideways and say, there's guests that come into our church and that may be dying and on their way to hell. Mm -hmm. And if they are not getting all that critical information, are we then liable? I, I can't answer that. But I just want to throw that thought out there. So let's, let's look at this. This is a common phrase that everyone knows. It has 70 consonants in it. Okay, so 30% degradation, we're gonna lose 21 consonants, so that's one, every, that's one out of every three consonants. I'm gonna try to read this. Or go so load T word that e gay his ole, e gotten so, tie whoever leaveth in high should not peish <laughs> uti ha ever past him <laughs> life. Amen. <laughs> I hope you're blessed by that. That's 30, no, no. That's 30% that's degradation. <laughs> Here's 20% degradation. Or God so load the word that he gave his only begotten son that whoso, whosoever he leaveth in I'm shall not perish but have everlasting life. 15%, we're now losing only 11 consonants. That's one out of every seven consonants. Or God so loved the world so love the world, hat he gave high, only begotten son, tie whosoever believeth in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. There it is right there. I know all of us understand that. But you put that in the ears and eyes of a guest. The ears and eyes of, of, a, of a family that you've just invited off the bus route that has had either zero to little exposure of church life, they're not going to catch that. When our choir sings, one of the things I'm so focused on is not, can I understand it, but can a guest understand it? We can lose information but still figure things out because we know the thought process. We know the flow. We've heard the song before. It's familiar. We've grown up with it. But you put a guest in there, are they going to make that mental, emotional connection, that, that intimate one-on-one -on -one connection? So how about this one? Who wants to read this? Anybody want to try it? You guys are a bunch of... Yeah. Here we go. O session, O a guitar does out may one a mu kin in or do ools ache a craft man kill wit basai tool manist itself in lean oldie joins or lee ab abeling careful abeling on uh, okay and em <laughs> emeralds <laughs> On, on, <laughs> I should have proofed this, I'm sorry. <laughs> on instruction of useful, useful loud speak array is a college to oath art at isri in crat snan sip in why. Expense raftsman shy is a direct e e impression. Oh, chat, chat, French. <laughs> so there's 190 consonants in that phrase. At 30% degradation, we've lost 57. How about this one? Now this is 20% degradation, we've only lost 38. How about this one? We've only lost 15%. You guys are starting to get it. But how about this? Possession of a guitar does not make one a musician, nor do tools make a craftsman. Skill with basic tool manifests itself in clean solder joints, Orderly cabling, careful labeling on panels and terminals, construction of successful loudspeakers array, arrays is a challenge to both artistry and craftsmanship. In my experience, craftsmanship is a direct expression of character. Don Davis. So, you put yourself in a position like that where you're having to guess constantly, you're going to get a fatigue, you're going to get tired. Our brains can figure things out, but by the time you've figured this out, you've already missed this information. And when we're wanting to lock people in on our conversation, and we're having a hard time communicating, how long are they going to stay focused? How soon is it going for them to start drifting from the message? Speech is a semi-continuous stream of data, delivered at a rate of three to five syllables per second, while the listener has a short working memory, so that's about four to seven seconds, we have just enough time to decode the information contained in a typical sentence and move it to a longer term memory before new incoming data replaces it. That's Robert Oswood. It's happening so fast. Happening so fast. And if your church has a sound system in it, you're asking that sound system to take that message and broadcast it to the entire audience so they can make that connection. So when you start looking at it this way, our sound system, our sound people become a lot more important. But then when you realize the very first thing that we're focusing on is the sound coming in, maybe it's worth giving attention to how are we putting sound into the system? Are we working with singers? Are we working with people on this is how you hold the microphone? 
one of, one of the, uh, just a, it seems like it's really common right now. When somebody's singing, they can't quite reach for it. They arch their back. They go up on their toes. When they arch their back, they're losing the support. They're making things tighter. We watched a person in our church choir uh, Sunday night. She was raising her head, trying to get to those notes. As she was raising her head, she was constricting everything. And constricting everything is making a tighter, more strained sound. Not to mention what that's doing to her vocal muscles. And that can help tend to make a more of a nasal tone. So are we focusing on the very input of the sound? I think that's worth paying attention to. So what is sound? Sound is vibrations that travel through the air or other medium that can be heard when they reach the ear. How do we create sounds? This is an app I use and we're going to look at three different sections. We got your typical line graph up top, so that's going to be an FFT, Fast Furious Transform. We got our typical RTA, Real Time Analyzer, and then this is a spectrograph. This is looking at sound through color. Watch how I pronounce the letters A, B, C, D, E. Let me pause. When you're looking at this, this is the lows, the mids, and the highs. Okay? Our piano range goes from a little over 4,000 hertz down to about 20 something hertz. So this is the range of the piano. Okay? So just to give you context, lows, mids, highs. What letter was I on? E. e, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Where do we place those in our sound system? What parts of our speakers, what parts of our microphones, what parts of our ears, what parts of our bodies are creating those sounds? Really fascinating. I don't have time to dig into that, but I just want to show you that we have sound that our bodies are creating so effortlessly, and we're asking our sound system to reproduce it faithfully. Just like we want a preacher to reproduce the text faithfully, we have that same job as sound technicians to do the same thing. So let's go back here. Um, so this is called a speech banana. This is where a lot of our vowels are formed from, and you can look on there. There's a lot of information. We're going to go through this real quick, but it's just showing you where you get a lot of information from those vowels, from those consonants. I'm going to break it down to where this is a little bit easier to look at. So middle C on the piano is right here, about 261 hertz. Okay? So our first section right here, this is the fundamental sounds. So you can see 125 up to 250. Our first vowel, main vowels, and third vowels are happening in this section, also with our main consonant areas. Our high consonants are right up here. So I told you the piano stops a little above 4,000 hertz. If you saw some of the sibilant sounds when I was talking, those were way up high on the graph. Why do we care about this? Because in just a few moments, we're going to talk about where do we put those sounds, what happens with the sounds in our sound system. So number two, we're going to talk about the mi microphone real quick. AKA, it's also known as the input transducer. It's a diaphragm that's vibrating. So when you think about your microphone, think about it as the ears of the sound system. That's the acoustic gateway into your sound system electronically through a diaphragm. It's vibrating just like our eardrums are vibrating. We're going to look at just a couple polar patterns. Brother Joe uh, talked about this yesterday up here and then downstairs. Polar patterns, when, when you're choosing a microphone, you need to choose what type of pattern. What are you going to do with the microphone? And I'm going to show you what I'm doing with this microphone. So when you're looking at po polar patterns, there's a half a dozen different polar patterns to choose from. Those can get real confusing. It's like, what am I looking at? Why am I looking at it? Well, let's look at it this way. Kind of shows you how a microphone is going to pick up those sounds. So a cardioid is going to pick up the sound right in front of the microphone. Super and hyper are going to do the same thing, only with tighter bands. Omnidirectional is going to pick it up 360 degrees. Bidirectional, they're also called figure eight. They pick them up opposite of each other, 180 degrees out of phase. 
This is the microphone that I'm wearing right now. This is called the Shure MX150. It comes in an O, which is omnidirectional, or it comes in a C, which is cardioid. I'm wearing the omnidirectional version. Another thing that's really important when you're looking at microphones is what is the frequency response? So the frequency response is really important because I just showed you we're picking up sounds. We're picking up vibrations, so we need to make sure that our microphones are going to accurately pick those up, but then they're also going to help amplify them or shape them to help us do what we want to do. So in this, I'm really concerned about speech transmission. So this is the cardioid version, and you can see the cardioid has a bump up here. If we look at this graph, this is zero decibels. Anything above, we're amplifying. Anything below, we're subtracting. Here's middle C on the piano, about 261. Here's 1K. The high end of the piano is uh, 234 right here, 4,000 hertz, okay? So this is a cardioid. Here is the same mic only in an Omni. This is exactly what I'm wearing. You can see the Omni has more of a flat frequency response. And then this Omni mic offers you two options up on the high end. It offers you a normal cap and then it offers you, offers you a bright or a presence boost. So that presence boost gives you a lot more sizzle. So if your speakers are lacking, you can change to more of the presence to give you more of that sizzle, that crisp. Why is this important? Because we're looking for uh, a really tight, really flat frequency response from 125 hertz to about 5,000 hertz. If you're familiar with telephones, especially before we started getting really good cell phone coverage, it was a very limited bandwidth. You listen to the AM radio, you listen to old radios on airplanes, or even radios how they communicate. People years ago realized that from about 125 hertz to 5,000 hertz, so right here, this was the most important area for speech transmission. They were looking for a smooth frequency response that was more important than an extended high range and an extended low range. So when we're looking at our sound system designs, we're wanting a smooth frequency response from about 125 to 5,000 hertz when it comes to speech. Now that's typical, okay? Everybody's going to be different, every room's going to be different, every voice is going to be different. I told you we're going to look at the electronics more downstairs if you show up. If not, I'm going to bed. Uh, but I want to throw out a couple ideas if you don't make it downstairs. In electronics, I want you to think about this. The electronics is going to be mostly your uh, mixing console, your EQ, and your amplifiers. Your mixing console, I tell everybody, play the mixing console as if you're playing the piano. Hands on the faders, be anticipating, be engaging, be proactive. Add your style into the sound system through the mixing console. I consider the mixing console the heart of the sound system because that's where I am literally inches from the electrical signals that go through that mixing console. So there's no more important equipment in my mind for the operator than having a good mixing console to work with. Okay, so we've got amps, EQs, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, this afternoon. Gain staging is really important, making sure that we're not distorting from one piece to the other, but yet we're maintaining a high signal from one component to the other. But I would say this, everybody's gonna have a favorite piano player and everybody's not gonna have their favorite piano player. And what amazes me at our church, there's piano players I love and there's piano players that they're, they're coming. Okay, they're doing good. But it's amazing, you can take the same instrument and you can get two different sounds out of it just by the operator. Okay, we could put Kevin at the piano and we could put me at the piano. Diametrically opposite sounds. Same instrument, same room, same strings, same tuning. Same things with your sound system. The person that needs to be running the sound system shouldn't be just a status quo, that's good enough. I'm gonna turn it on and my hands fold. That's not it. Remember, they're helping facilitate the communication process from start to finish. The speakers, here we go. The most important part of your speakers is the horn. The horn is very directional. The horn is what helps amplify our high frequencies and gives it direction. High frequencies are very directional. Low frequencies are very wide or omnidirectionals. In parking garages, in malls, in theaters, in big sporting events, when they have to get information out, they go through a horn. 
because the horn has the directivity, the power, the punch to get through the crowd noise and get to your ears. So every system should have horns in their speakers. Most of the time they'll have a woofer and they'll have a horn. This horn needs to be aimed where you have ears. This horn doesn't need to be aimed against the wall because that's just going to cause unnecessary reflections. Every system is also going to have one of these. This is a woofer. This is what gives us the depth, the strength from the sounds. But guess what? Most of our vowel sounds are produced in this range right here. Most of our consonant sounds are produced in the range where our horn is at. Some speakers don't have a horn. This speaker would be a duplex. This has a woofer and this has a tweeter. This is a very bright sounding tweeter, but you get 10 feet from it, the power of that tweeter tanks. It just doesn't have that projection to reach and reach and reach. We got downstairs several different horns that we're gonna show you this afternoon. Uh, some of the horns that we use at our church, uh, and they're not by any means the biggest, but you get into big stadiums, there'll be horns that will be as tall as me punching that sound. So when you're thinking about your speakers, this is the most important spot to be thinking about. Your low frequencies are gonna fill up the room, but your high frequencies are very directional. Now, uh, I can't tell you the typical range where, where, the, where the sound starts in here, but a lot of times it's gonna be around 800 to, to, to 2000 hertz is where the sound starts to come out of the horn. It's gonna vary on the manufacturer or the style. Okay, so the horn. Moving on, the room acoustics. Ah, this is gonna be where we take probably the majority of our time. Number five, the most expensive part of any sound system is the room that it goes in. And I know that's common sense, but it's also been said this way. Every sound system's design stops about four feet in front of the speakers and the room takes the rest. We're in a design era right now that not much attention is given to the live sound in design. Now I'm going to give you this example. When we renovated our auditorium just two years ago, we told the contractors from the very beginning, you're designing the renovation around our sound system. You're to maintain the acoustics, you're going to maintain the environment, but you can make it pretty. So the company hired a acoustic consultant to manage the acoustics for us. They came in measured before and they're supposed to measure during and they're going to measure afterwards. About a third of the way through the project, the budget was going up, money was going down, time was going up, patients were going down, and the contractor started making these changes that he wasn't telling anybody about. And those changes directly affected the acoustics of our room. So when we came back into our auditorium after almost one year of being out, same identical sound system, it was a totally different sound. I started off with the same tuning because I was convinced they were going to maintain the acoustic, the acoustic integrity of that room. We started to find out that they very much messed up the acoustic integrity of their room just by their furnishings that they put in. And we'll go over just a few of these. Modern church services are not focused on congregational singing. They're focused on more of the experience. They're used to pumping out massive amounts of energy as if we were in a concert and just blasting it into the room. But they don't want that energy coming back onto the stage. So we're seeing more and more auditoriums designed that are heavily attenuated out in the room. Well, you'd think that was good until you start congregational singing. And then congregational singing starts and they can't hear the sound in the room. So then they think, well, I'm singing too loud. And they start singing softer and softer. But in these big megachurch movements, they're not worried about the congregation. They're just worried about the experience that's on the stage going that direction. So we're seeing systems that are way too loud punching sound into rooms that are heavily attenuated. Also, modern systems, they're putting a lot of speakers throughout the room to get the sound closer to the people so they don't have to do as much engineering or throw the sound as far. So when we're talking about room acoustics, here's just a handful of terms that we use in the industry. Sound transmission class, ceiling attenuation class, noise isolation class, noise reduction coefficient, articulation class, reverberation time, signal to noise ratio, there's the uh, STIPA, this is st speech transmission index, 
through public address, through PA, there's our Alcons again, and then TEF, time, energy, frequency. And we can go over these more downstairs, but I wanna focus on one thing here. This is the NRC, this is the noise reduction coefficient. Every building material that we place in our auditorium is gonna have an NRC value or rating. It's gonna be how much sound is absorbed into that material and how much sound is reflected. So if we look at this graph right here, stainless steel, we'll just look at that. Stainless steel at 250 hertz is going to absorb 34% of the sound, but it's gonna reflect 76%. Thank you, 66% back into the room. At 500 hertz, it's gonna absorb one quarter of that energy. At 1000 hertz, it's gonna absorb only about 20%, and then at 2K, it's gonna only absorb 15%. So that's stainless steel. So this is your, I wanted to show you, how do we come up with the NRC? So these four values are added together and averaged to a common NRC value, noise reduction coefficient. Why is this important? Let's go back to the speech banana. Our hearing is centered in this section right here, around 4,000 hertz. That's where our ears hear most efficiently, and I'll show you a chart at the very end of this presentation. But you think about this, the main consonant area, the high consonant areas. So those, the NRC is designed to help attenuate or monitor, I'm sorry, designed to monitor this section of our spectrum. Because when we're putting a premium on speech, we need to make sure that we are not heavily attenuating those areas or heavily exciting those areas. So here's another chart. Same thing, just a few more options. So marble, right here, marble is going to absorb zero of the energy and reflect 100%. Gypsum is probably uh, 0 .5, 0 .05, glass 0 0.05. Uh, how about this? Plywood is going to be uh, probably 0.25. Fiberglass, so one inch thick fiberglass, one inch. It's going to absorb 75%. Carpet is going to absorb a little bit over half and reflect. That's why it's important when you're designing or renovating or looking at building a new space, the very first thing that you focus on needs to be what are we doing in that room? Is that room gonna be used as a concert hall? Is it gonna be used as a recital hall? Is it gonna be used as a speech hall? So if our primary focus is the speech communication, we need to make sure we go into that knowing that, hey, we need to design this space to work with sound. Most people will renovate a space and think about a sound system separately. We'll uh, peruse through this, and I wanted to show you this right here. At the very bottom, is the ceiling tiles that were placed back in our auditorium after the renovation. So we're gonna look at the NRC and we're gonna look at the AC. So the NRC is the noise reduction coefficient. The ceiling tiles that they put back in our auditorium have a 0.9% absorption and only reflect 10%. They also have an articulation class rating of 180. 200 would be a perfect rating in articulation class. Articulation class is going to attenuate, let's see if I can back up here. Articulation class works around 4,000 hertz. So the AC rating of those ceiling tiles was 180. That means it's, it's attenuating almost 90% of the sound right here. And that's where we hear most efficiently. So our general contractor that was charged to renovate our auditorium but keep our sound system in mind and not change the acoustics, drastically changed the acoustics. Those ceiling tiles were above the choir. We had 80, 90 voices in the choir. We could barely get that out into the room. The choir members were saying, I, all I can hear is myself. I can't hear people standing right next to me. It's because the ceiling tiles that they put in the room were absorbing those frequencies that we hear most efficiently. All in the name of we think it looks good. So when you're looking at doing a renovation, and I know there's several people in here or are going through a renovation, be mindful that the acoustics of the room is the first thing that you need to look at when you're designing your auditorium, if it's new or if it's a renovation. The ear, and this is where we'll close with this. This is the chart that I was telling you about. This is called a Fletcher Munson curve. When you, oh man, that's dropped down too low. 
Let me get out of it and see if I can just pull up the picture. Okay. It's a little fuzzy. So for us, when we say, I want to hear all frequencies evenly, that would be a flat frequency response. So for our human ears, in order for us to hear all the frequencies in our spectrum from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz evenly, this is what the curve looks like. So I told you, we hear most efficiently around 4,000 hertz, which is gonna be this green band. So you can see it dip down way low. That means we need very little electricity in this band for us to hear and understand. And then think about where most of our consonances are coming from, right here in this orange band. But think about where, where it ramps up. These are the low and then the sub bass sounds. Right up here, these are the highs, these are the sizzles. This requires more electricity. So that is a line graph looking at it backwards. Where we hear most efficiently is where the contractor attenuated the heaviest. So I'm just trying to throw out the idea of our ears are important. Room's important, sound's important, the voice is important. I told you we were ending with this, but uh, I got one more, sorry. We'll close with this. My wife and I were doing our uh, devotion Monday night, and uh, we came across this, uh, Philippians 2, 14 and 15. And I took a picture of it, and I've just been thinking about it all week long. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. I want to leave you with this final thought. Be a problem solver, not a problem causer. Be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. And that's going to be in your specific ministry. If you're the sound tech, if you're the janitor, if you're the music guy, the great, uh, the unholy trio right there, or the unholy trinity. If you're a bus driver, if you're a Sunday school teacher, we have enough bickering going on. We have enough people that say, this is my area and you can't tell me what to do. I hope everybody in this room would be above that and say, I need to improve. I mean, that's me. I need to improve. And I think about that right there, the bottom section, shine as lights in the world. Can we do that when we're bickering and when we're fighting and we're causing strife? Not very well. And we have lost people coming into our church every week. They need to see the light shining in this world. Thanks for listening.